In the brutal summer days of 416 BC, Athens and Sparta were at war. The Athenian democratic empire's encroachment on neutral city-states had balkanized Greece and encouraged the creation of a rival coalition of its neighbors. Many of ancient Greece's city-states fell under Athens's Delian League sphere of influence and joined Sparta's Peloponnesian League. Athens ruled the seas with its powerful navy and Sparta ruled the land with its powerful warrior class. By 416, the two leagues had been at war for roughly 15 years, leaving very few undeclared non-combatants. Although the small but prosperous island city-state of Milos was originally a colony of Sparta, it had chosen to remain neutral. The Athenians believed that the Melians would eventually side with their kin, so they decided to preemptively invade the island, force the Melians to kowtow to Athens' superior force, and demand payment of tribute. The Athenians landed on the small island with 37 ships and 2,000 soldiers, raided the countryside, and demanded that the city submit to them without a fight. The apocryphal negotiation that ensued would go down in history as one of the first case studies of political realism. The weaker Amelians made arguments of a transcendent morality, while the stronger Athenians made appeals to common sense and pragmatism. In his book, The History of the Peloponnesian War, Philicides wrote that the Athenian emissaries told the leaders of Milos that they were to lay down their arms and submit or be destroyed. The Athenians infamously said, the strong do what they weak, and the su- weak suffer what they must. There was no dishonor in being destroyed, wiped away from the history books, by an obviously superior force. The Melians retorted to the Athenians that they did not have proper justification to invade Milos. The Athenians responded that they did not ha- need a justification because they are strong and can effectively take what they want. They further stated that if they left Milos alone after invading it, they would appear weak to their allies. The Melians then made the claim that in violating Melian neutrality, the neutral states would rise up against the tyranny of Athens. The Athenians retorted that the neutral states did not have the time or resources to save the Melians, and that they would not be stupid enough to challenge Athens when Athens, in all likelihood, is going to win the war and crush its enemies. The Melians switched to making claims of legitimacy. They said to the Athenians that it would be cowardly to give up. The Melian leadership would lose all of its authority if they did not protect what was rightfully theirs. The Athenians responded that it is only shameful to surrender if there is a chance that they could win. They then passively told the Melians that they had no chance of holding out against their invaders. They then aggressively said to the Melian leaders that they would no longer have a people to lead after the Athenians slaughtered them all. The Melians then began to make moral rationalizations for their refusal to give up. The Melian said that the gods would be displeased at Athens' disagreeable actions. The Athenians countered that the gods did not care about the power politics of mortals. It is the natural godly order of things that the strong rule over the weak, because it is the relationship of the gods to men. Frustrated, the Melians argued that their Spartan kin would rescue them from the siege. This claim was obviously a bluff, because the Athenians had complete control over the Aegean Sea. Spartans did not have a strong navy and would never be able to save the Melians. This dialogue ends with the Athenians making one last appeal to reason. If the Melians would only surrender their pride and give in to a stronger foe, they would survive. The Melians refused and turned away the Athenian diplomats. According to Thalicides, the Melians put up a valiant fight, staving off the Athenians for almost a year. However, traitors from within the city of Melos forced the Melians to surrender. The Athenians then put all of the grown men of Milos to death, sold the remaining women and children into slavery, and then sent Athenian colonists to repopulate the island. This tale has lasted through the ages due to its powerful message. Pleas for morality are not worth a damn if they are not backed up with the power to enforce them. Many political theorists from Machiavelli to Bismarck to Mao have used this tale to denounce abstract pleas for morality by stating, all political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Like the sword of Damocles, the power of a sovereign rests on that sovereign security. Whether in the form of soft or hard power, one cannot enact change without a will to power and the might to take what one wants.